Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you all, and uh, it's a privilege to have this opportunity to, to share a message today. Um, special welcome to the visitors who are here today. It's good to have you. Um, so recently, I've had the opportunity to be studying in the book of Philippians, and so I'm going <coughs> to give a message from uh, Philippians chapter 2. Um, so if you, have your, if you have your Bible along, um, you can go ahead and, and open up to Philippians chapter 2. Um, the passage that I, that I chose is a, a beautiful passage. It's also a challenging passage, and it's a passage that shows us the glory of Jesus. So Philippians 2, uh, we'll start reading at verse 5. Um, But before I read the passage, um, I'd love to just take a minute uh, and pray together. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for all of your blessings to us. Thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can all be here together. Thank you for speaking to us through scripture. And I pray that as we work through this passage, um, you would inspire us and you would challenge us and change us. Amen. So Philippians 2, um, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 18. So I'm going to go ahead and read the whole passage now. uh, And I'm reading from the ESV. This is Philippians 2, 5 through 18. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. So there's a lot of things we could look at in this passage. Um, For the most part, we're going to kind of just work through it, and I'm going to bring out various points uh, from the the different verses. We'll start at verse 5. Here in verse 5, Paul says, have this mind among yourselves. Um, And I think um, a a good way to think about this is, is a mindset, a mindset. So Paul is encouraging the Philippians, take on this mindset. He's trying to show them how they should think about life. And what is the mindset? What mind are they supposed to have? It's the, we could say, it's the mind of Christ. He says, have this mind among yourselves, um, which was also in Christ Jesus. The translation that I read here is a bit unusual. It says, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Um, But I think most of the translations say, have this mind within you, something like that, which was also in Christ Jesus. And I think that's the the accurate rendering. So Paul is going to go on then and explain what this looked like in the life of Jesus. What did Jesus do? And that mindset is the mindset that we're supposed to have. He's saying, just like Jesus was, that's how you should think. So in verses 6 through 11, Paul's going to kind of unpack what that mindset looks like. Um, so we'll, we'll go through those and we'll, we'll see what this looked like for Jesus. And then in verses 12 through 18, um, he shares a little bit more about what this looks like for us. And, and we can see some specific ways in which we're supposed to take on that mindset. So this idea of the mind of Christ is kind of going to be a, a, a framework maybe for the, for the whole message. While we're still here in verse 5, I think it's worth pointing out that this verse um, connects back to verses 1 through 4. So verses 1 through 4 have this whole thing about unity. 
Um, do nothing from rivalry or, or conceit, but count other people more significant than yourselves. Um, I'm not going to go back to those verses. That could be a whole sermon in itself, but um, that's maybe a conversation for another time. Uh, but it's worth noting that Paul's encouragements about unity and what it takes to hold the church together, that ties in with verse 5 about having the mind of Christ. So just something to notice while we're here. So, let this mind, as the King James says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what does that look like? So we come to verse 6, and we're told that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, maybe I should just say a little bit something about these verses before we jump in. So if you look at verses 6 through 11, it feels like the whole kind of section is all this one, this one section. It all kind of belongs together. Um, it talks about how Jesus came down, like his sort of condescension, and then exaltation. And a lot of scholars think that these several verses, verses 6 through 11, might have even been like a, a poem almost, or maybe even like a song of some kind. Some people call it a hymn, like a, the Christ hymn. Um, it might have been something that the earliest Christians would sing, or maybe something that they would, would uh, you know, tell, tell each other, or something that they had sort of preformed that Paul might possibly have incorporated into his letter. We can't know for sure, um, but that's possible. In fact, later in this message, I'm going to read a verse of a, a song that I think ties into my message, and it's possible Paul's doing the same thing here. So verses 6 through 11, we can think of them as kind of a Christ hymn. It's a beautiful, beautiful sort of section explaining what Jesus has done. So we come to verse 6, and we're told that Jesus was in the form of God, but he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, is what the ESV says. And different translations kind of bring out different ideas here. Um, some, some would give the idea of something to hold on to. So Jesus did not count equality with God something to hold on to. And others would say something more like something to use for his own advantage. And I think there's probably some, some value in both of those. Either way, the idea is that Jesus didn't hold on to his divine status, his position of honor, his, his station, if you will, as something to, to keep for himself, but he was willing to give it up. If you can kind of imagine a scenario where you suddenly become, you suddenly find out that you are the heir of some rich businessman, okay? So it, it just so happens that when this rich businessman dies, you are going to inherit his whole estate. Not a very likely scenario, but just, just imagine. Um, probably the, temptation, the, the, the natural tendency for all of us would be to think of that as something that we're going to use for our own advantage. We'd be like, you know what, this is great. I'm going to inherit a whole pile of money at some point, and so maybe I can buy my house instead of having to rent one, or maybe I can you know, buy a better car or do some, some fun travels or something like that, right? Something to use for our own advantage. We would probably also tend to think of that as, uh, we, we would probably hold on to it and not want anything to take it away from us. Right? So if, you, if there was some kind of scenario where maybe someone else was going to inherit it, we would probably be like, no, no, no. I want this inheritance for myself. Something to hold on to. And that is exactly what Jesus did not do. Jesus did not hold on to his, his exalted position as something to keep for himself. In verse 7, we're, we're told a little bit more what that looks like. It says that he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And this is where Jesus comes down and becomes human. The idea here is that Jesus emptied himself, and I think this comes through more clearly in some of the other translations. Jesus emptied himself. We have to be kind of careful because Jesus is still God, and he didn't stop being God when he became human. But in, in some very important ways, he, he left aside, he, he laid aside, some, some of his, the use of some of his divine attributes, and he, he gave up his position of honor and exaltation. So it's hard for us to imagine, but, but right, think of Jesus, the one through whom all things were created, who eternally existed in perfect peace and perfect joy with God the Father. He has perfect power and perfect knowledge, and he comes down from there, and he becomes human. And this is the mindset that we're supposed to take on. This is what Paul's talking about when he says, let this mind be in you. It's really hard to kind of illustrate or, or like make a comparison for what that's like. You know, how can we 
get, get our heads around what Jesus did coming down. And people sometimes talk about like incarnational missions and how you know, we're gonna go like live among the people. And that's, that's really, really good. But like no amount of, I don't know, condescension that we do ever really like measures up to what Jesus did. But maybe, maybe one illustration that can help us a little bit is the story of Eric Little. I feel like somehow someone was talking about him here not very long ago. Probably you've, a lot of you have heard of Eric Little. So he was this Scottish uh, runner, athlete. And it's, it's an amazing story. So um, he, this is the guy, his story is told in a, a film, a play called uh, Chariots of Fire. I'm sure some of you have seen it. I haven't, but everyone always talks about it. So there it is, Chariots of Fire. So the, the story is he was the Scottish athlete and he was a super, super fast runner. So he, he was gonna go to the Olympics and, and run the 100 meters. And, and you know, he was really fast. And then it turned out that the heat, like the, one of the kind of first runs for the 100 meters was on a Sunday. And he really strongly believed in like setting aside Sunday for spiritual things. And so he just felt like he couldn't do it. So he skipped the 100 meters and, and he, he stood up for his convictions. Then he ended up running the 200 meters. This is the Olympics, right? He ran in the 200 meters and he won the bronze medal. And then he went in for the 400 meters, which wasn't even his specialty. And somehow he defied the odds and he won the gold medal. I don't know if you guys can imagine what it would be like to, to win a gold medal at the Olympics. I don't really think I can. But just like, can you imagine if like one of the guys in our youth group was like, oh yeah, like he's, he's like super fast. He was actually in Tokyo the other year running in the Olympics and he won a gold medal. Imagine if we had somebody like that. It's, it's almost hard to, hard to get your head around. But I think if there was someone like that, everywhere you go, people would be like, oh, there's the Olympic gold medalist. Did you hear? He ran, you know, this race and he got the Olympic gold medal. Everywhere you'd go, you'd be honored and you'd have all this fame. And probably people would come up to you and ask you to sign their t-shirt and ask you for like inspirational advice, like, oh, you know, tell me something that's gonna motivate me, right? That was Eric Little, 1924, became a hero, right? And the next year, 1925, he stepped aside from all of that and he went to China to be a missionary. So his parents actually had been missionaries before, and he went to China to follow in their footsteps. And he served as a teacher and an evangelist, and I'm sure he did some running after that, but he never, he never came back to run in the Olympics. He never sort of came back to the United Kingdom to enjoy his fame and his prosperity. He laid it aside, and he went to a place with a lower living standard to serve as a missionary. Again, compared to Jesus, that's nothing, but I think that gives us a little picture of sort of laying aside glory and, and position. Let's think for a minute about what Jesus gave up by coming down. So did you ever think about the fact that Jesus could have been born or could have had a shining face? Remember that story from the Old Testament where like Moses, he's like, you know, talking to God and when he comes back to the people, his face is like just absolutely glowing. And I don't even think he knows about it, right? And all the people are like, Moses, like, your face is literally shining. Like, we can't even look at you. So they have to put some kind of, like, you know, cloth over his face. Jesus could have had that. Jesus could have been like, you know what? I just want everyone to know who I am. So I'm just going to, like, have my face shining all the time. Do you remember when Jesus went back to the village where he had grown up? And a lot of the people just didn't believe in him. They were like, well, whatever. We know this guy. Nothing special. If he had gone in with his face glowing like that, like, too brightly to even look at, I think they probably all would have believed him. But he didn't do that. He just appears like an ordinary person. And he shows up, and if people don't believe in him, well, they don't believe in him, and he just, he just takes it. Jesus also, I think, laid aside, for the most part, the use of his divine power, right? So God is omnipotent, God can do anything. And when Jesus was in the world, he, for the most part, laid that aside. Now you're probably thinking like, well, what about all the miracles? And that's true, so Jesus, you know, still used his divine power at certain times. But it, it actually seems like for the most, like for, for most of Jesus' life, the 30 years before his ministry began, it doesn't really seem like he used his divine power at all. Uh, stories about clay birds notwithstanding. But it seems like, you know, based on what we have in the Gospels, it doesn't seem like Jesus was doing miracles at all. He just laid that all aside. And then even, one, even once, once he started his public ministry and he went around doing miracles, he never used his divine power for his own comfort or his own convenience. He used it to serve. In fact, there's that, there's that you know, famous story where Jesus was on a really long fast, and then at the end he's like super hungry, and there's no food around, and the devil comes, and he's like, hey, why don't you use your divine power to just like create yourself some food? 
and Jesus doesn't do it. He's laid aside, for the most part, the use of his divine power. There's also that striking uh, little incident in John 4 where Jesus and his disciples um, are going, going somewhere, and it says that Jesus was weary from his journey. The one through whom all things were created has gotten tired out from walking, and so he just sits there by the well while his disciples go into town to buy food. This is what it means, this is part of what it means, that Jesus emptied himself. He laid aside that. And in some mysterious way, Jesus even laid aside, at least in some, in some measure, his divine omniscience. So omniscience, right? God knows everything. Somehow, Jesus, and this is, this is striking, but here's, here's what Jesus said when he was talking about like the end of the age. He said, concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. It's a bit of a mystery, I think, how Jesus can be God and at the same time not know something. But somehow, he's, to some degree, emptied himself. He's given up the use of what was rightfully his. And I think we, we really can't overstate the importance of this, this emptying, the incarnation, Jesus coming down. We can't really overstate the importance of this for our faith. Um, if you think about what is Christianity and what makes Christianity different from the other religions, um, this is right at the center. So nowadays, people like to talk a lot about what all the religions have in common, right? So, you know, in Christianity, we believe in God, and, you know, in, in Islam, they have a belief in God, and then, you know, there's Hinduism, they've got a bunch of gods, and so all the religions, they all kind of have something to say about God or what that means. And all the religions have some kind of scripture, right? You know, like we, we adhere to the Bible, and then Muslims have the Quran, and then, you know, there's the Rig Vedas, and there's these other scriptures out there. And a lot of religions also have some category for, like, a prophet, or someone who kind of hears a message from God and then, like, proclaims that to everyone else. So we've got people like the Apostle Paul, you know, he, he writes a letter like Philippians, and then, you know, Muslims would say that Muhammad hears from God. Uh, you know, there's like Buddha, who's this kind of enlightened teacher. So there's some kind of basic similarities. But folks, no other religion has anything like Jesus. There is no religion out there that has God himself coming down to become a human. And this is part of what it, this is part of what it looks like for this is part of what Paul means when he talks about having the mind of Christ, this willingness to give up, to come down. Jesus' condescension keeps going. So if we, if we go to verse 8, it says, And being found in human form, so Jesus came, he was human, he was a man, he humbled himself, and I'd like to add, he humbled himself even further, right? He's already humbled himself by becoming human. Now he humbled himself even further by becoming obedient to the point of death. Jesus didn't come as, you know, basically just like on a kind of mission. He just like shows up and he kind of does his ministry and then when it's done, he just whoosh back to heaven. He submitted to death. And I think this is even more mysterious than the fact that he somehow doesn't seem to know everything. The fact that Jesus could die. Can God die? Is it possible that one day all the Christians in the world are going to wake up and be like, oh, none of our prayers are getting answered. I wonder if God died. Is that possible? No, of course not. But somehow, Jesus took on humanity. He lowered himself so much so that he actually submitted to death. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death and then it says, even death on a cross. And I think there's kind of an intentional move here with the way that, that this is, is phrased. It could have just said, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on the cross. But instead, it almost separates out the cross part as if this is like almost an extra step of lowering. He lowered himself by becoming human, and then he lowered himself even more by submitting to death and then he lowered himself even more by submitting to the death of the cross. It's like he lowered himself as far as, as possible. I think we're, we're kind of familiar with the idea of, of crucifixion, right? We, we think about this a lot. Um, obviously, the, the pain and the, the whole design is to make it as cruel as possible. But there's also this very important component of shame. Like part, part of the whole point of crucifixion was to, to like make the, the person 
take on as much shame as possible, right? So when the Romans crucified someone, they didn't just do it like over in a kind of prison courtyard somewhere or like out in the middle of nowhere. They would always do it like right on the main road uh, where lots of people were passing by, almost like a kind of living billboard or maybe like a dying billboard, uh, basically saying this person has been utterly defeated. This person is just completely like done for. And often this was used for uh, people who had kind of withstood the authority of the, the Romans, people who had tried to fight against the Romans. And so then they would, you know, the, the Romans would, would make a public example of them and be like, see this person who tried to stand up against us? He is completely defeated. And that's the extent to which Jesus humbled himself. He didn't just die. You know, Jesus could have had somehow set it up that he died maybe like a, a kind of general on the battlefield and, you know, Often when a soldier dies in battle, everyone honors him and like, oh, you know, like, this is our kind of hero. He, he died this heroic death, people, people say in the world, right? But Jesus didn't do that. He humbled himself all the way to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And then to add to this, there was the mockery. So while Jesus is hanging on the cross, you get these religious leaders hanging out, you know, just kind of nearby and like making fun of him and like, hey, why don't you come down and, and save yourself? And Jesus doesn't do any kind of power move. He doesn't like call down lightning from heaven to zap them. He doesn't even say anything. He doesn't threaten them like, your turn's coming. He just stays there silently and he dies. And this is the mindset that Paul wants us to have. This is what he means when he says, let this mind be in you. I wanna go back for a second to the story of Eric Little. So Eric Little goes to China in 1925 and in 1943, I believe, after he had been there for a number of years teaching and serving as a missionary, uh, World War II was, was in, in, in swing, was happening, and uh, the Japanese were taking over parts of China. And he ended up getting rounded up along with a bunch of other missionaries in an, and, and put into an internment camp, basically kind of a, I don't know, I think of it like a very large jail cell or something, basically a whole bunch of people packed in somewhere where they kind of can't leave. Um, not good, you know, not, not a lot of good, healthy food, not really much medical care. Everyone just kind of like packed in with, with nothing going. And while he was there, he actually died. So again, maybe a little bit of a, a comparison for us, what this might look like. Jesus humbles himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, but that is not the end of the story. God has highly exalted him, we read in verse 9, and bestowed on him the name, pardon me, bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even the people who crucified him, even the people who mocked him, even the people who didn't believe in him will someday submit to Jesus' authority. Jesus lowered himself and lowered himself and lowered himself and then God exalted him uh, to the highest degree possible. There's probably a lot more that could be said um, on these verses, but um, I think we'll move to, yeah, we'll move to, to verse 12. So in verses 12 through 18, we're gonna see just a little bit more the kind of how this might look for us practically. So Paul says, therefore, my beloved, and, and let's just notice the word therefore, right? So in light of everything we just saw about how Jesus lowered himself, he emptied himself, and then he is now exalted to God's right hand. In light of that, what, what should we do? What should this look like? Therefore, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, here it is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Maybe we should note quickly this idea of salvation. I think we're very used to thinking of salvation as kind of something that happened to us in the past, like, oh, I got saved. And that's true, that's right. Those of us who believe in Jesus have been saved. But our salvation is also something that's still in progress. And our salvation is also something that's going to be completed in the end. We are saved, we have been saved. But we've still gotta work out our own salvation. With fear and trembling, he says. This is no small matter. So, okay, Paul, why should we work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Why can't we just take it lightly? Well, verse 13 gives us the answer. For it is God who works in you 
both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because our salvation is not our own personal project. This is not a, a self-help uh, plan where you kind of make yourself a better person. It's also not just the Apostle Paul's idea. So our salvation, both past and present and future, is all about God working in us. This is really kind of striking. He says that God is working in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And I think what he means is God is operating, God is at work in each one of us producing both desires to will, I think that's what he means, desires and actions that are in line with, with what, what God wants. God is working in our lives to make us love the things that are true and good and beautiful and to make us live in a way that comports with that. And because it's God at work within us, that calls for fear and trembling. This is no small matter. We might illustrate this, maybe this is a little bit of a, a I don't know, silly illustration, but if you think about nuclear power plants, right? So, you know, you can build this kind of whole plant to turn nuclear energy into usable energy. Uh, I'm not a nuclear scientist, so I don't know all the details, but I do know that there's a lot of potential for danger, serious danger, in nuclear energy. So if someone is going to be, you know, building or operating nuclear energy, you kind of have to do so with lots of precautions and lots of, you know, very high standards to make sure you do everything right. Maybe Paul would say, if you're doing, if you're working with nuclear energy, you need to do it with fear and trembling because it's nuclear energy you're talking about. This is not just a little campfire. This is nuclear energy. I think that's a little bit the, the, the uh, train of thought here. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because it's not just you. It's God working in you. In verse 14, we come across one of the, uh, one maybe specific way in which we, in our just daily lives, can have the mind of Christ. He says, do all things without grumbling or questioning. And I think the idea here is something along the lines of complaining, arguing, disputing. Do all things without grumbling or questioning. And this is one of the ways we can have the mind of Christ. It's also one of the ways, just one small way, in which we can work out our own salvation, as he says, with fear and trembling. Now, when I was thinking about this verse, when I was pre preparing, my mind went to a quote from Mark Twain. Supposedly, Mark Twain said, it ain't the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. So I don't know if you, if you find this true. There's some verses in the Bible that I don't really think I understand. You know, all that stuff about like predestination and how does that fit in with like human choice? I don't know. Or then there's that zinger in 1 Corinthians 15 where he talks about people being baptized on behalf of the dead. It's like, I don't have a clue what that means. But I think if I'm honest, it, those verses aren't really the ones that trouble me. Verses like this that I actually understand perfectly well, these really are kind of the troublesome ones. Basically what he's saying here is, don't complain. Just don't complain. And this is troubling because if you're anything like me, you can think of a lot of uh, sort of reasons to complain just all the time. Like even just small things I find myself complaining about. Sometimes th verbally and sometimes just in my heart. Just little things and sometimes big things too. If we go back, once again, to Eric Little, um, he was in the internment camp for, I don't know, two years or so. And afterward, someone who was there confined with him uh, said about Eric Little, quote, in all the time in the camp, I never heard him say a bad word about anybody. When I found this quote, I was like, oh my goodness. How, what does it take to become someone like that? Folks, this is, in just in one small way, this is what it looks like to have the mind of Christ, to be willing to give up what is rightfully ours, to trust God enough not to complain. Now, I think it's, it's important to think through a little bit how we apply this. So I think, you know, Paul says, don't complain. But there is, I think, a healthy way that, to, to speak up if something is bothering you. Okay, so let's imagine a little scenario where um, your neighbor plays like really loud music at like 11 o'clock at night, 
okay? And it's close to your house, you can hear it. So you're in bed, you're you know, just about to fall asleep, or, or maybe you've already been sleeping for three hours. I don't know what time you guys go to bed. Um, but, but maybe you're, you're in bed around 11 o'clock, you're trying to fall asleep, and all of a sudden, there it is. Right? Your neighbor is just blaring his music. And it keeps you awake. So there's a, there's a healthy way to be like, okay, this is it. It keeps happening repeatedly. Okay. So there's a healthy way to say, okay, this is, this is not good. This is bothering me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to address it. Um, so maybe you go to your neighbor and you say, hey, you know, your music, it's, could you not play it so loud or not so late? Right? So there's a, a healthy way to try to deal with this kind of thing. It, it wouldn't be healthy to, to, to think of this as just, oh, if anything ever bothers me, I just have to stuff it. I just can never do anything about it. So say you go to your neighbor and you say, hey, can you not play such loud music so late? And your neighbor is like, oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. And then a few nights later, you're in bed, it's 11 o'clock, and there it is. Da, 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 and you're like, here he is again. And then I think is kind of the real test, right? Because then, okay, maybe, maybe you go back to your neighbor and you mention it again. But then, like, when you wake up the next day, is it, and, and this is so easy for me to picture myself doing, right? You know, you, you're, your family, you go to work, just whoever you talk to, it's like, ah, oh, my neighbors, they're so crazy. Like, he just plays this awful music at 11 o'clock at night and it keeps me awake. And you know what I mean? This is like, and, and, and again, I have so far to go here. Um, this, I think, is where, where the rubber hits the road. That, that attitude of just kind of whatever, whatever bad things are on your mind are just going to kind of spout off about them. I think also we need to recognize that there is, there is a, a time, and it's very appropriate, to talk about the difficult things in your life with other people. And this, this can be really healthy and really, really normal. Um, in fact, Paul even does some of this in some of his letters. He'll say like, oh, you know, Demas has forsaken me. He's gone. And so there, there's a sense in which we're supposed to bear each other's burdens. But then I think there's also a, a place where it goes beyond that. Um, and yeah, we can sort of get into a mindset of just complaining about whatever, whatever is bothering us. Let's think again about Jesus on the cross and how he, he just takes the suffering, he takes the shame, he takes the mockery, and he doesn't complain. There's a beautiful song in, in our songbooks that we, we don't sing commonly, and it, it gives one verse that kind of pictures what this was like. It says, with taunts and scoffs, they mock what seems thy weakness, with blows and outrage adding pain to pain. Thou art unmoved and steadfast in thy meekness, when I am wronged, how quickly I complain. Thou art unmoved and steadfast in thy meekness. When I am wronged, how quickly I complain. Part of the reason that Paul gives this specific encouragement about not, not being a grumbling and, and disputing, uh, we can see in verse 15, he says, Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. I don't know about you, but I think the world is a pretty dark place. It seems like everywhere we look, right, there's wars, there's selfishness, greed, pride, and if we're honest, even in our own hearts, I think, we often find that our own hearts are, are darker places than we wish they were. And one way, just one small way, in which we shine a light in the dark world is to put aside complaining. Okay, let's move to verse 17. And here's where Paul uh, talks a little bit more about himself personally. So he says, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Somehow, after all the things Paul has said, um, take on the mind of Christ, Jesus emptied himself, and we should be willing to do the same thing, the whole thing about working out your salvation with fear and trembling, and also about like not complaining, and now he's mentioning that he himself might be killed. So he's using this kind of illustration of pouring out a drink offering, where once you pour out a liquid, especially if you pour it out as a sacrifice, it's gone, you can't get it back. And he's using that as kind of an illustration of the fact that he might be about to die. Paul's in prison when he's writing this. So you might think that after all of this, the humiliation, 
the, the fear and trembling, the, the no complaining, and now the prospect of him dying, you might think that after all that, Paul's going to be kind of heavy-hearted. But somehow, after all that, he's like, you know what? I am really, really happy. That's basically what he says. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. And then in verse 18, he wants them to rejoice with him. He's like, hey, I'm so happy. You guys should be happy with me. So what's going on here? What does Paul know that we don't know? Um, right, I think if I was like in jail and, and for, you know, for, for being a Christian and, and thought that I might be about to be killed, and someone asked me to write some kind of, I don't know, essay or something about what have you learned about the spiritual life through your experiences, I would probably talk a lot about, you know, like suffering and how God leads us through trials and this kind of thing. But actually, the letter of Philippians that Paul's writing from jail, it's actually got a lot of joy. Joy is actually kind of one of the themes of the epistle, isn't it? So in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. And then in chapter 4, verse 4, he says it again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. There's also in chapter 1, verse 18, and this is where Paul's talking about, apparently some people out there were like somehow proclaiming the gospel or talking about the story of Jesus with the intent of bringing more trouble onto Paul. And somehow, Paul is like, you know what? In chapter 1, verse 18, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. He's like, you know what? Even if people talking about Jesus is going to create more trouble for me, I'm just super happy. This is amazing. So what does Paul know that we don't know? And I think to understand how this can be, we have to go back to the Christ hymn, that beautiful telling of Jesus' condescension and exaltation. And maybe, maybe to the part that I didn't talk so much about. So in verses 9 through 11, we read about the exaltation of Christ. God has highly exalted him. Jesus laid down his life, and then God exalted him. And I think the reason that Paul can be joyful in the middle of all these things, and the reason that Paul expects the Philippians, and by extension us, to be joyful, is that somehow, just like God exalted Jesus, we, in the same way, we who lay down our lives with Jesus, are going to also be exalted. We will share in the triumph of Jesus. So Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God, receiving all of the honor and glory that he deserves. And somehow, his exaltation extends to us. I don't understand completely what this will look like, but let me read to you a few of the unblushing promises of reward that are found elsewhere in the New Testament. So here's one from... Jesus uh, toward the end of his life when he's talking about like the end times or the end of the age. He says, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Yet I don't know exactly what that means to shine like the sun, but somehow we're not, we're going to receive far more than just, you know, a, a good living situation, a happy place to live. We ourselves are going to shine like the sun. We're going to somehow participate in the glory of God. Here's one from Revelation. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. <clears throat> For the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Did you catch that? Not only do we get to live somewhere where God shines brightly and we get to enjoy his glory, but somehow we are going to reign. We are going to reign. Just like Jesus humbled himself, and is now exalted, the same will be true of us. And then finally, uh, one from 2 Timothy. So Paul says, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. We will reign with him. I, I can't fully picture what that means. But I think that the reason Paul has so much joy in this letter, and the reason we can have joy in the middle of sharing Christ's humility is that we know that we will share in Christ's exaltation as well. When we submit to Jesus and allow him to live his life through us, his victory becomes our victory. In the end, sacrifice gives way to exaltation. Suffering gives way to glory. And even those, those Christians who have given up everything, even someone like Eric Little who gives up his whole career and fame and honor and ultimately his life, they will not have lost anything in the end. 
everything will be repaid. So this is my uh, closing encouragement to you all, to have the mind of Christ, adopt this way of thinking, which was in Jesus, of being willing to lay aside, to surrender, to give up. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because God is the one working in your heart. Put aside complaining and shine as lights in the world. But most importantly, look to Jesus, who is even now exalted at God's right hand. Someday, every knee will bow to him every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus will be victorious over all the forces of evil and somehow, beyond all hope and nearly beyond belief, we will share his victory. Folks, the mind of Christ is the path to triumph. The way down turns out to be the way up. And the path of suffering is the path to glory. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for sending your son. I pray that as we go through our daily lives, you would help us to take on more and more the mind of Christ. And I pray that you would give us the the spiritual eyes of faith to see Jesus even now exalted at the right hand of God. And I pray that this would work itself out in our lives every day. Amen. What was that encouraging? Take a look at who Jesus is and uh, who he became for us so that we can share in his glory. God is good. Well, there's a hand back there, the Dwight. So Jesus Christ, who chose to empty himself, to make himself of no reputation, says to me, If you want to follow me, leave everything. Mm -hmm. So I can choose that also. And a lot of what I'm leaving is my garbage. (laughs) It's myself. Things I don't want anyway. So, but it's a reminder to me in many situations, Jesus voluntarily made himself of no reputation. He voluntarily emptied himself. And you know, when, we really are, when we're in that place, we are so secure, mm. we have nothing to lose. We've lost it already. <laughs>